All right, so the last time, I see we have lots of casualties. No, I don't see many people are not here, but I'll start anyway. So, because uh, we have to, my next class is exactly five minutes after this, three floors down, and in a very awkward place, so I have to make sure I'm, 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 that I am on time. So, uh, we talked about uh, uh, privacy. Uh, mm, uh, member functions and constructors and formatting and using CN and CL. Uh, we uh, hopefully understood that CN and COUT are uh, uh, instances of uh, a class called iStream and OStream. iStream being the, inst the, the class that CN is made up of and O stream, the class that C out is made up of. And we learned that their functionalities, how to format things with them, it, usual stuff, okay? Um, going through what we have done, we, uh, to, f to give you an example, we created the student class and the class had dynamic memory allocation inside. We made the name dynamic and we had a student number, we had an initialization and the allocation function that initialized name to the proper values, made sure that the um, uh, pointers that we are using for our dynamic memory allocation are set to null when they are not used. They are reset to null after the allocation and uh, to make sure that those things happen, which means initialization happen at the moment of creation, we learned that there is a procedure called constructor that we can create. We cannot call it, it's not a function, but the system can call it when, will call it when the object gets created. And we put in it function in it, which was this one. Well, not that, what did I do? What did I do? Wrong button. Sorry. I wanted to do this. There we go. Yeah, so, so we put the initialization in the constructor. We said constructor is uh, written like a function, although it's not a function, uh, but it's easily recognizable because it has the same name of the class and it does not have a return type. It doesn't return anything because it's not a function. Uh, and whatever we put in it, it's going to get it had to happen only once at the beginning of the program. And we put our init over there, which sets the uh, the name to null and sets the student number to zero. And then deallocate was the one that de kind of deallocates everything. Uh, and what we did over there was uh, uh, deleting the name. Now, what I did wrong over there was that because the allocate is a function and it's possible to be called at any moment and any time, I need to set m name to null PTR. Although I'm not in here, I am using it in uh, in the constructor. But here, I just created memory leak. I said prevent memory leak. It actually creates memory leak. The reason was that. When the allocate was getting called, it was deleting the name. Well, that's fine, um, but it's not setting the name to null PTR, which means if I use the allocate at any other place that immediately I don't have dynamic memory allocation, it doesn't tag the name as a free pointer. When you just delete it, it doesn't do anything. It just releases the memory. It doesn't set the pointer to null. Therefore, the pointer is not tagged to be free. Therefore, if it's deleted again, the delete will try to delete a, a garbage address that is in there and crash. Therefore, because the allocate is a function that we can call it at any moment of time, we need to set it to null PTR so we don't shoot ourselves in a foot. So remember, rules of dynamic memory allocation. If a pointer is unused or it's at the moment of creation, they have to set, get set to null. No question about that. At any moment reallocation is happening or deleting is happening, 
if that thing is not happening at the very end of the lifetime of the function, you have to make sure you reset the pointer to null after deleting, which we are doing here now. So we did all these beautiful stuff, and now we have our um, student created as, uh, as we see. So we have a set function that receives actually, it's kind of a read function, not a set function. So later on in future pro examples, probably I'm going to change that one to read. I uh, just wanted to show you the overload. That's why I did that. But uh, yeah. Next thing we need to do over here is to, to see, um, instead of actually setting in stuff, I want to be able to have something like this. I want to be able to have student s, and I want to have over here I want to actually create a student with a name in it. Just create it that way. I can't do that because I don't have a constructor that provides that. We just learned about default constructor, which we call it no argument constructors. But we have another special type of constructor. So two constructors are special, the rest are not. One, no argument, which means when the object is getting defaulted. So if I create, for example, if I create over here an array of, if I create over here an array of five students, if I do that and I run the program, I will see that default constructor is getting called five times because I'm creating an array of students and there are five of them. And because nothing is provided, it will be called. That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, and that's five. So five times the default constructor is getting called because it's an array of five students and I did not mention what type. So the default uh, constructor or no argument constructor is called. But what I need right now is to be able to set a student to a specific thing at the moment of creation. That is a special one too. And I'll tell you why, okay? So when I do something like this, I need a constructor that accepts only one argument, okay? So what I can do over here is to write something like uh, in the header file, of course. So I'm gonna bring up the header file. So I'm gonna create a, a constructor a constructor that, that accepts one that accepts one uh, argument. And therefore doing that, it's going to make the other one possible. So as soon as I do that, I don't get any mess error messages. So let's create that to create that constructor in the code. Obviously, it is a student constructor and constant character pointer name it is. And now I need to do the dynamic memory allocation, all the good stuff. Because I'm a lazy person, I don't want to do the thing over and over. I'm going to make myself uh, uh, make my work easier by just, by, by just coming over here and adding a default value of zero to student number. So I would say if, if a student is uh, getting created with a name, a student number will be set to zero. I have to set that one later. Bad thing, awful thing to do, but hey, I'm just, this is just an example. Logically, when you have a student, it must have a student number, right? But I just want to show you an example. So because I want to reuse my function, I'm just going to put a zero over there. And, and then in here, now I can actually say over here, set uh, name, and that's it. So now I have a student number, and it will uh, uh, call the set. So this is how you make your life easy, okay? So just uh, make sure to reuse your code. I don't have to rewrite the whole thing again. I just set that one to zero, and then afterwards I can set it to whatever I want. So now, if I run this program and I, if I do my show thingy over here, if I actually do s dot uh, display over here and display the 
the student, we will see that it has, uh, it's, it's going to get created uh, only with one. So let's run it. Now I'll tell you what's special about it in two seconds. It's just constructed with one argument, but that creates an, an interesting side effect. So it comes over here, obviously it sets the name, student number is by default, student number is by default zero because that's the default value. It deallocates, obviously let it deallocate, no problem. Uh, actually it is, it deallocates, do you think it's okay? Uh, do you think it's gonna be okay if I deallocate? Let's see what happens. So if I come over here to name, oh, we are lucky. The damn thing is zero. It's not something. It's, we are extremely lucky because I did I in it. I did not in it. So this is if you take this to matrix, it's one of those situations. Here, luckily, that name that I had over there has not null in it, but there is no guarantee. You follow what just happened? I just wanted it to crash, but it didn't because I'm just lucky because. I did not set that name to anything. By chance, it's null. If you are on matrix, probably it has some value in it. And then it's going to crash. Okay? So, or you're going to get a warning telling you that you have conditional uh, jump based on, a, uh, based on an uninitialized variable, which means name is uninitialized and I'm trying to delete it, uh, which is a wrong thing to do. So what I need to do to make sure everything is good over here is to actually uh, initialize the student beforehand to make sure everything's clean to start. And we have so many different ways of doing it. So every single time we are doing it in one way. So now I'm using init, and we know init sets the name to null and student number. So it kind of initializes everything, and then I can start setting, okay? But there are other ways of doing this init that is easier. There are two more ways to do this. This is one of the ways. This is uh, from our knowledge from IPC 144. So we don't need to know any uh, C++. We just write a function that sets everything to null right at the beginning. And because I know student uh, uh, constructor gets executed at the moment of creation, then that's what happens. So it comes in, it comes in here, initializes. So num becomes zero, that becomes zero. Then it sets the name. Now life is beautiful. If it actually deallocates, it's null. That null doesn't do anything. It comes out and it sets it, copies it, sets the student number obviously to zero, comes down, and I have myself a student. And if I uh, display it, obviously it's going to be a student. Uh, part at SLA with the student number being zero. Okay? Now, so, but, but to make this thing like work better, I, I would say if name, I'm going to do it like this. And, and in here, instead of just showing the next thing, what I will do in here is this. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to do a C out in here. And And in here, I'm going to say if student number exists, do this, okay? And um, otherwise, I'm going to say not registered. Why is it giving me an error on student number? Oh, it's M student number. Bad boy, I am. Okay. So in here, I'm going to say uh, they could have written that thing is a little more intelligently. but And then I have a new line over here. So I'm going to stop it over here. Uh, and I'm going to show the new line at the end. So now if I run the program, it's going to be more is this logic driven? Let's put it that way. So it's going to say Fred Soleil not registered. No student number, right? Are we okay down to this point? Are we okay? So that shows how methods can work intelligently, which means you don't care 
how it is. You just display it. If it's not set, it's going to say it's invalid. If it's set but doesn't have student number, then and so on and so forth. Are we okay with this? Are we good? And we could have the exact same thing for a student number with, with uh, a student just with a student number. Of course, uh, um, uh, it's a stupid thing to do, but again, I'm just doing it f for the sake of uh, creating examples. So in here, I'm going to create actually another one, student that receives a, an unsigned integer. And for this one, what I would do is, uh, for example, create something like this. I'm going to say student, student uh, unsigned integer student number. And this one is easy. I'm going to say init, obviously, initialize it. And I'm going to say set to no name and student number. OK, so now I can actually set a student with uh, uh, only a student number, one, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to display them both. So I'm going to have r.display and run. So what I will have for the first one will be no name, student number is that. This one is Fred Solihan, not registered. Are we okay with this? Now, what is, are we okay with this? Are we okay? So what is so special about this type of constructor? What's special about it is this. So let's actually save, it's actually, I'm going to copy this. And this is 01 student name, which is perfectly good. I'm going to remove that. Continue my code in prg.cpp. OK? Now, a single argument constructor is literally initializing it to one value, which means I could actually write it like this. So remember. Assignment at the moment of initial at, at the moment of creation is not an assignment. It is an initialization. It, act, it is actually a call to a one argument constructor. And it works the exact same way for integers too. So I, I could have something like this. I can write over here. So to just show you that it that's that's the case, I'm gonna write integer i and in here I'm gonna write two hundred. So it's the one argument constructor for the i. And if I say over here, C out i, you will see that it's going to show 200. So it is, uh, in C++, there is, uh, there is no assignment at the moment of creation. When you put assignment, you're literally calling the one argument constructor. And there is no way around it. Got it? Are we OK with this? So if I run this, you will see that the outcome will be identical to the other one with absolutely no difference. All right? And also, remember that uh, for the new version of uh, C++ that we have, oh, oh. for the new version of C++ that we have, we can initialize a variable like this too. So that is perfectly valid too. These are all the same. Of course, I need that. OK? All right, calling this will be exactly the same thing. No difference. A single argument of constructor will be run, will be called, and the result is the same. Are we okay with this? Do we understand what one argument constructor is? Right. So again, remember, <clears throat> assignment, and this is something that we're going to need it later on when we come to operator overloading, for you to recognize that the assignment at the moment of creation is not an assignment. It's a call to a one argument constructor. 
All right. <clears throat> so, done with that. So, essentially, three different versions of man. Now, let's go for the fourth one. What if I want to set both of them at the same time? So, no mystery over there. It's going to be a two-argument constructor. A two-argument constructor is a two-argument constructor. There is no assignment or anything. Well, you cannot put assignment in front of it because there are two things over there. That can't be done. Um, but if I wanted to create a two-argument two constructor, this is what I'm going to get. So it is essentially the same thing as this one. And it has a st uh, an integer student number over there. Sorry, unsigned integer. Okay, and the implementation is exactly the same way as the other one. So, uh, uh, unsigned int student number, and I'll pass the student number to this one, and it works the exact same way. So. Multiple, multiple argument constructors are all the same. And to, not to give you two different examples, I'm just going to show it to you right off bat like that. So I can say it something like this. So that's the first one that I'm creating. And the second one could be used, for example, with uh, a traditional way of C++, which is... They are both perfectly valid with absolutely no problem. Okay? You can either use parentheses or you can put curly brackets. Same thing. And you can do this too. But again, so Way. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? So these two, line number six and seven, is the new way of thing, but nobody puts that assignment thingy. Who wants to press one extra key when there's not needed, right? Same thing. So I run this, and you're going to see the outcome is, is identical for all of them. Absolutely no difference. Okay? Any questions down to this point? Well, these are all the constructors. Anytime you want to create any object and you want something happening right at the beginning, right at, so this, this is important for your quiz that you're coming the next time. Uh, the constructors, they happen right after the object is created, not right before, not at the time, right after. So constructors happen right after after, immediately after the object is created. Destructors, they don't, they are not called when the object is de getting deleted. It's right before the object is being removed. It's the last thing before, the, the last thing the object sees before it dies. That's the destructor. So first destructor is called, then object is removed from the scope, from the memory. Okay, so destructor right before death, constructor right after birth. Okay. Are we okay with this? You okay? For now, for initialization, use either another function or write statements inside the constructor to initialize all the members. Later on, we're going to find out that with the new C++ came initialization in the members. So you can actually do it like this over here and make sure any constructor that is being called Null is, uh, name is null, so you don't need to do anything. And in here, I could have done like this again. Anything that is being called, or if I want a student number to be one, two, three, four, five, when it's created, I can do that. So 
any constructor, default, one argument, two argument, anything is called, before the constructor starts doing or its work, you can actually set it like that, which we are going to talk about later. And the, the other one is a little more, co not complicated, I just don't want to give you too much information. The other one is another place in an in initialization area that I'm going to introduce later, uh, which you can do the same thing. So they're all the same. This one is new. It wasn't, well, you couldn't do it in old C++, uh, but the rest of them are all from old one. So, yes? How do you read this? Uh, 11, uh, 14, 17? It's not 20. Um, it's 20, uh, like I think, I don't remember it was like 14 or 17, but it's recent. In C and C++ are oldest languages ever. Like with exceptions of PL1 and Fortran, and Pascal and things like that. Th these are, la C and C++ are languages where all the modern languages are based on. Anything, like Go language in uh, C sharp, uh, JavaScript, Java, um, all these languages that you see, the syntax are based in C, C because it's a very clean and quick syntax. It doesn't have too much of typing. Um, but when I say it's recent, when it's five, ten years, it's recent in age of C. C has been out there for a long time. C++ has been out there for a long, long time. Okay? Like, long time. So long that when I was in university, I used to, I studied it. It's just a long time, and it's been a long, long time ago. Okay, so, so it is a long time. Yeah, so I don't think you're ever going to encounter any compiler that's going to give you an error when you put it over there. If you did, you immediately go tell them, hey, your compiler is a dinosaur. Please, update it. Okay, so... So, uh, and also, let me just uh, uh, check this. To, I'm going to say retarget. Retarget. Should be a retarget over here. Retarget. Um, no, not there. So, I'm going to go to project properties. So, the one that I'm compiling with now is C14. Okay? So, um, and I don't even have anything older than that. C14 is the oldest one that I have here. So, and I don't think we use anything that is going before 14, so comfortably use your visual C, C and, and do the compilation. So, we, we were done with con, uh, constructors and all that good stuff. Uh, um, next thing I want to do, yeah. Uh, Talking about reusing your code, okay, um, and uh, how we do that, how we reuse our code. Um, to reuse your code, what I suggest, like the very first step, uh, is to have a toolbox. So it's, you're like a, like a mechanic or a, or a or electrician or a plumber. Goes to work, takes the toolbox with them. So when you go from project to project, workshop to workshop, you don't want to redo this stuff. Like when I tell you, get an integer that is between these two values and show this error message in su if such and such. You don't have to rewrite the code again. All you need to do is to bring that package that you had and include it to your project. Okay, And we have done that. All your workshops, if you look at it, it says uh, custom code submission. And you have a utils class that you can submit. Uh, so if you are submitting your, let's say, workshop one, if you go, if workshop three, if you go W3-P1NAA, uh, uh, sorry, slash P1NAA, when you do that, you are submitting uh, part one for section NAA. If you want your utilities to be included, you say UP1 underline NAA. If you do that, then it's going to actually uh, require that thing to come in. How do we do that? This is how it's done. So first of all, create a class and, and that, and if I were you, if I were you, I would actually create uh, a repository on git completely separate and call it utils and have this class in there. So anything new you're adding to it, you can push to it. 
So later on, you can just always pull and copy the latest one. I would do that, but it doesn't matter. Anyways, so create, I'm going to create a new class. So add a, a class, and I'm going to call it utils, capital U, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> and this utils class of mine has the old, all the stuff that, that, that uh, we always talk about. So uh, again, I'm gonna, I think it's the last time I'm going to do this over here, but I'm going to say if not defined, so if not defined, uh, SDDS utils. And in here, I'm going to say define and namespace SDDS. So this is the, the standard thing that we do in OP244. So we'll bring this up. So utils class will go in here. And we have utils.cpp over here that is including utils.h with a namespace being added over here. Not using, sorry, 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 sorry. Namespace SDS. So I have my utils, okay? And anything you want to create, you add to your utils as a method. What these methods have in common? They are utility methods. They have no relation with each other or maybe they have some relation with each other. So instead of using string header file, write your own string header, string copy stuff in here so you don't have to include that and have that secure warning, no secure CRT thingies at the top. You can do all the things over here yourself and you use it and that's an amazing practice, okay? As we go through, I'm gonna add, it, add my own so you will see the utils getting bigger and bigger. I'm not gonna rewrite the code over and over. So what I'm going to do in here, for example, it's talking about that integer thing that we were talking about. So let's get an integer, a foolproof integer from the entry, uh, from, from uh, the user. So what I will do in my class thingy, uh, first of all, I'm going to make it public. Uh, if I need, so for now, I'm not going to have any attributes for this utils thingy. It's just a bunch of functions that I'm packing it into a class for utilities, something that is uh, going to be used. If I need some kind of variable over there for some, some kind of an uh, attribute over there to do something with, sure, I can use it. But it's not a must. So I'm receiving an integer, so I'm going to call it int get int. Right? I'm just getting an integer. And I want it to be a foolproof integer. So how do I do it? So, I'm going to write this one, and then you can change it to whatever you want later on, whatever integer that you want to get. And um, uh, actually, you know what I was thinking? Yeah, let's not make it complicated. I'm just going to do this and then we're, <laughs> we're going to make it better and better as we go. So that's get int. So what I'm going to do in here. So first of all, as soon as you write something like that, you have integer value, you do like that, and then you're returning the value. Now you think, this is what I want to write, okay? So the very first thing that I want to do, I want to get the integer from the input, therefore I need IO stream. So in here I'm going to say include IO stream and uh, uh, obviously using namespace namespace uh, std and we're gonna go see in the value oh so I get a value I don't have any restriction to the size of the value if it's big or small all I want for the user to enter an integer and nothing else. And I want it to be foolproof. I don't want to let them go until they give me a freaking integer. And you know the person who's sitting over there, especially even if it's you yourself, that uh, uh, as soon as you become a user, you're going to do dumb things. So you got to make sure that that doesn't happen. So C in value. So 
first of all, I have to check to see if they actually entered an integer. So I'm going to say if C in, it means they actually entered an integer, right? If C in is the same thing as saying if not C in dot fail. Potatoes, potatoes, the same thing, okay? When you are saying C in, C in is a polymorphic object. When you put it in a condition, C++ sees that you are putting a C in where a Boolean value is supposed to be. So it tells to C in, give me your Boolean value. To C, giving Boolean, C in Boolean value means if I am okay or not. So if C in returns true, and you'll learn how to do that soon for anything. Okay, but C in actually, so if I say if not C in, it means if C in fails. If C in, it means C in is okay. So if C in is okay, if C in is true, everything is good. If C in is true, so if C in is not true, what do I need to do? I'm going to say C out. What do I say? Uh, invalid integer. Try again. Right? That's it. That's all I'm going to do. Clearing buffer, schmuffer stuff I'll think about later. I'm going to walk through it in all different scenarios and see all the paths and I see if I need to clear the buffer anywhere or not. I'm not going to touch it for now. So, and in here, if I do that, definitely CN is in a failure state, right? So I should apologize. So I'm going to say clear the state, the fail state. I did not clear the buffer. I just said I recognize that you failed. If it doesn't fail, what's going to happen? If it doesn't fail, I need to see if they ended the entry of an integer with, a new, with an enter, hit enter key, right? So I need to have some kind of a thing, character, new line, that is supposed to be new line when I'm getting it. So in here, I'm going to say value is equal to C in dot get. Now, if this thing is not equal to null, so in here if I say if value is not equal to backslash n, then what do I do? I have to tell to use a hey, only an integer, please. Okay? So in here I'm gonna say C out only, only an integer, please. Retry. Correct? So, oh, I, I put value over here. I was supposed to put new line. What did I put value? And nobody complains. What the heck you're doing? Now you were thinking what the hell. <laughs> I was thinking what the hell you're doing. And when I, am I using that new line anywhere? I'm not using that new line anywhere other than this, right? So why am I actually creating a new line? I don't need it. So always criticize your own code. Like, I'm using a new, why do I do that? I'm just going to take this and put it in here. Why do I need that, right? So I'll get one more character. So if the next one, if the next character, so... It's got to be if the next char after int is not new line, okay? And that's what comments are for, by the way, when things are not clear, okay? You comment it. So I'm saying over so because I know you didn't know what is that, I'll put it over here. So, so the only, so, uh, if it's good, I come over here. If this is true, it's bad. So the only place that everything is good is here, right? So L is this is all good. Correct? Right? You okay with this? All right. And I need to do this over and over. So now I'm going to say over here, do. Why? And in here, I have to have a condition. Do I need to think what is a condition? No, don't do that. Don't just simply say bool done is equal to false. 
and in here say done is equal to false. So every time you start, your done is false. Then in here, you're, you're going to say while not done. Do that, right? And then in here, done is true. So I don't need to worry about anything. Okay, do the conditions that way. Put a flag and make your life easy. So now I'm saying, uh, I know that false thingy over here is like kind of, if, if you did, we could actually do it like this too. What happened? Seriously? I hate this intelligence. I'm trying to put open, close, curly bracket. It, okay, anyways. I think they went a little too far with helping with typing. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the stuff that we're doing. So yeah, so in here it sets it to false, tries to get it. Now let's go through it and see where do we, where, when do we have garbage? And we need to catch the garbage, okay? So in here I'm saying, done is false, beautiful, I'll come over here. So done is false. I get something, I'll do a C in. If C in, so it gets one over here. So at, if this thing is not equal to backslash in, this is where I need to flush, right? Otherwise, I'm good. But if this is false, it means I have only garbage, <laughs> right? So in here, so this is supposed to be flush too. I have two choices. Either I can put a flush over here and a flush over here, or Make myself comfortable over here. Say, hey, if it is not done, something was wrong, right? So cn dot, not cn, cn dot ignore and backslash. So if it's not done, it means it's not done, right? Are we OK? I have myself a get int, hopefully, that is pretty smart now. So if I try it, so. Um, I can actually use it, use it in my student if you want to, but I'm going to write the unit test for it first. Did I save this as 0, 3 by any chance? Let me check. No, I didn't. So this one is going to be 0, 4 actually. So if, oh yeah, so if you wanted to use this, in, this utils thingy in your student, then what you needed to do over here is to simply say, oh, 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 did you just see what we did over here? <gasps> that was bad. Okay? That has, the header file must be after the standard ones. So if I wanted to use it over here, I'm going to say over here, include, include, uh, utils.h. And now when I'm here, I am getting the student number. Where is so C in student number? I'm gonna say student number is equal to what do I need to do? I need to instantiate utils now, right? To use the method of the util, I need to have an instance of utils. Correct? So before doing anything in here, let's let it be. Let's come for our unit test, which is for our tester program. So I'm going to come over here and say, see out integer. And I'm going to say v is equal to what do I put in here? And then, so what do I do? So I have a question. When you are using C in, are you instantiating it? No. When you use C out, are you instantiating it? No. And we know C in is an instance of I stream. Somebody did I stream C in somewhere. Somebody did O stream C out somewhere. They created a C in and C out object where you do C in dot ignore C in dot get or see out dot with. So they are instantiated somewhere. How can we do that with our utils? So have some object, let's say, called u, and we do u dot anywhere, we include the header file without instantiating it. How can we do that? Very simple. 
what do we do? We go to our utils.cpp and right at the top of utils.cpp in here, we create a file scope variable. So in here, I'm going to say utils u. So I have an instance of utils inside utils.cpp, and this is a file scope variable. Unlike um, IPC144, they call it global. This is not global. This is file scope. It is only accessible in utils.cpp. No one else has access to it, right? So this is a file scope uh, instance called U of utils in utils.cpp. Okay? Now, completely forget C++ and answer this question. When you had a function in C language in a file, and you wanted that function to be used somewhere else in another file, what did you do? You had it a header file. What did you put in the header file? Prototype of that function, right? So to make a function not to be in a file scope, but become global everywhere you can use it, you put a prototype for the function, correct? What if I told you we can have prototypes for variables too? I can put a prototype for this utils.u and tell all the other fi uh, files, hey, there is uh, an object called u in another module. Go pick it up. You can do that. How do we create a prototype for a, for a variable? This is what we do. I'm just going to come down here. This is where I have the utils, it's where I have all the stuff, right? In here, I'm going to say extern utils u. By doing this, I am not creating utils u. I am telling to everyone in utils.cpp, there is a utils.u. You can go pick it up over there. So this becomes a prototype. So this makes this prototype, it's not a prototype, but it does the prototype. It does to a variable what prototype does to a function. So when I say a prototype, you know what I mean, okay? This prototype, which means I'm going to call it extern, extern, makes a file scope variable. global. It means anyone who includes utils.h will have access to you. Now, in here, instead of, I can actually say it because utils, oh, I didn't even include utils. So I'm going to include utils over here. So in here, I can now say u.getInt. So the object u becomes your toolbox. You could call it actually toolbox. Too long, but you can say toolbox.getInt. Yeah, too long, U is easier. So now if I do this, now I can actually say over here, C out V, and I can actually try it and see if it works. So I'll run the program three years later, four years later, it's going to say an integer. And I go bananas on this. This is how you have to test it, OK? And see if it fails or not. Did it fail? No. In invalid enter, try again. OK, sure. I'm going to put over here uh, 100 uh, things. Only an integer. Wait, let's retry, right? Now I'm in here, I'm going to put 34. And now I have the 34. So it is impossible for anybody to actually come into my get int and get out without entering an integer, and only an integer. Are we OK with this? But that doesn't solve the limit between things, right? So how do you want to do uh, something, say, I want it to be greater than this and less than that? I reuse my code. Easy. And C++ provided overloading for me. So I'm going to go int. 
utils, and let me actually go to the go to here and put it. So in here, I'm going to actually create another one. Int get int int min int max. Easy. So in here, I'm going to have the get int and int min and int max. Okay. So now that I have this, uh, <clears throat> and I already have a get int that is foolproof get integer entry. So I'll do the same thing in here. I'm going to go int value. And I'm going to say do. Now I know what, what I'm doing, so I'm going to be quick about it while. And I'm going, to, I'm going to say not done. Same thing. So bool done is equal to. I like this because uh, it's so clean. So I, whenever I have many decisions to make, I don't even think. I write this, then I do my thing. And I'll set this thing to whatever I want. Two good things it has. It doesn't let me do on the unconditional jumps out of my function returning, like having three return statements in the thing. It prevents that. Return, it forces me to write a, a, a solid code. And also, uh, it's, uh, it's easy with the conditions. So now in here, I'm going to say C in, int, oh, not C in, value is set to get int. So I'll get an integer. That's going to take care of validity of an integer to be an integer. I don't need to worry about that. All I need to worry about is, is to see if the thing is between the two things or not. So in here, I'm going to say if value is less than min or value is greater than max. Now I'm going to print a message saying see out. Say, I'll show something like this. So I'm going to say uh, minimum value should be less than um, So in here, I'm going to say that's going to show minimum. And in here, I'm going to say, no, uh, sorry. What do I write over there? So the value that we are entering. So I'm going to say value. So um, uh, val should be, and this one, I'm going to put max. So in here, I'm going to say max. And do like that, comma, and then retry. I think they, if they understand what's going on. So I'm showing that message, right? So if it's between this and that, do it and retry. And then I have to say uh, done is equal to true or false. It's just one condition. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove that done thingy. You see what I do? Now I see it's just one condition. In here, I can say done is equal to false. But I'm not going to do that. It's just one thing. I'm just going to copy this condition over here and be done with it. It's the same thing, right? So remove that variable. Get int if the value is like this print an error message and go back up. And if it's good, it's going to get up. Are you OK with this? So now, <clears throat> and what if I want to show, show a message too? So not to put it in a separate line. Let's add that one too. I'm going to add a, uh, an optional thing in here. I'm going to say um, uh, const character pointer prompt. And I'm going to set it by default to null PTR. So if they don't provide it, I can detect it. And in here, I'm going to put const character pointer prompt. And in here, right before they, I am doing anything, I'm going to say, if prompt exists, then see out prompt. So now they don't need to have it in a separate line. They can actually put it right in there if they want to. So, <clears throat> so in here, I'm going to, I can actually say, um, instead of that get in thing, EWF. So this is, uh, I'm going to say, 0, 05 uh, get int test. And in next one, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get in here.
And instead of having that C out over there, I'm going to say V is equal to get int 0 and 100. Uh, I'm going to say over here, enter your mark. I think that's good enough. Now I run the program. Obviously, it's not null, so it's going to actually show that value. So it's going to say enter a mark. Now, now in here, if I put garbage, this is get int working. If I say over here, 80 is my mark, this is get int working. But as soon as I say over here, 300, this is get int with validation working. So if I put over here now, I don't know, 50, it's going to say 50 and get out. OK? But I can make this one even simpler than this. I mean, like when you take a look at this, um, it's kind of ugly that I have the condition repeated twice, right? This brings us in something that uh, we uh, uh, in IPC 144, we had a concept called, called lazy evaluation. Do you remember that? Lazy evaluation? You don't remember lazy evaluation? Lazy evaluation is this. So... Where can I write? Right at the edge, and this will go. Oh, I'm good. OK, good. So if I have a light bulb, this is how it happens. So let's, so let's say I have a light bulb over here, right, like that. And that light bulb is connected to a battery, and that battery has a switch over here. If I turn on this switch, what happens? Light goes on, correct? If it's disconnected, light is off. Are we okay with this? No problem with this, right? So now take a look. What if I have the second switch over here? What is the, like how that light can go on? If they're both on, right? If the first one is off, do you care if second one is on or off? It's obvious, right? If the first one is off, you don't care if the second one is on or off. And so does C++. These are conditions. This is called an AND. And this is condition A, condition B. If A is false, it won't even look at B. Because it knows it's off. B will not even be tested. It will not even look at it. Are we OK with this? That's called lazy evaluation because, yes? That's short circuit evaluation. Short circuit, I don't know. I'm an old guy. We used to call it lazy evaluation. Oh, no, it's based on hmm. IPC. OK, sure. So that's short circuit evaluation. So short circuit evaluation, OK? And we have another short circuit evaluation which is the AND, which is the OR, and that's the one. OK, this is an OR statement. Now, for, light go, for the light to go on, only one of them needs to be on, correct? If the top one is on, do you care if the second one is off or on? No. So the short circuit evaluation uh, lazy evaluation, uh, <laughs> for or is the first one to be true. So if the first one is true, it won't even look at the second one, and it's not going to happen. Are we okay with this? Do we understand this? Beautiful. Using that, this is what I'm going to do. So while will only happen if this is true, correct? And if this is false, what's going to happen? It's going to get out, correct? If it's true, so I'm going to put it like this. I'm going to put it in a condition. 
and in here I'm going to say and. And I'm going to put this one over here. What's going to happen now? So let's say you get the value, and the value is not within these two. What's going to happen? This condition is going to go what? True, correct? Because this condition is true and it's and, it needs to check the next one to see if it's true or not, to decide if the condition is true or not, correct? So C out is tested to be true or false, which we can, like we did in an if statement, okay? But to do that, it has to execute it. Therefore, the message will be printed. The next one that they actually put a proper value in here, the condition will go false, correct? If it's false and it doesn't need to check the next one. So it's not going to get printed. And the same thing with the, the other one that we had. If you look at the code that pros write, especially when they are doing graphics and stuff that they want to have fast if statements, you don't see people write if not done do that. Usually that's not what they write. They do this. I'm saying done and C ignore. So if this thing, and I can actually put it down here now, but doesn't matter. So I can actually put that thing down here now. So this thing ought to be, it's going to be eliminated, right? So if not done over here, although th there, there is no if statement over here, but this is an expression. If you recall, the expression must get resolved and the value returned, right? Of course, we are, the value is going to go to cyberspace, but that's not our purpose. If this is false, which means done is true, C and ignore is not going to get evaluated. If done is true, this is going to be false. Uh, this, if done is false, this is going to be true, true, and then it has to actually evaluate it. So therefore, that happens. So I can actually put this now. I can put this one over here. And it works the exact same way. I could have put it in the other one. Let's actually put it over there. So. You will see code like this in your lifetime. Don't get shocked. This is just a quick and fast if statement. That's all. That's all it is. Okay? So I'm going to write it over here so you know. So <clears throat> and in here I'm going to say, Same, but quicker. And nobody's going to do that. They're just going to put it in this while statement because they want to write less code, right? Nobody wants to write a not done and then yada, yada. They're just going to put it like the other one. Yes? If you put that in the while statement, would that leave the line in the brush? Pardon me? Would that leave the new line in the brush in the while statement? It's going to pause at it, wait for it. So ignore does, ignore is simply a get yeah, yeah. until it hits the thing. So if there is no new line, if there is no new line in the buffer and ignore is hit, it pauses for you. But if, if, that's, if that's the while, someone enters a valid integer, uh, done is false, and it exits without even checking yeah. the ignore, that leaves it in line the No, because, because it's been oh, picked it's up. Been it's been picked up in here. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I pick up the new line. Okay. That's why I don't ignore it. It means the data ended. Okay. So, and to test it one more time, it's the same thing, quickly, right? And 30, right? And uh, for the other one, I should have put something like 300 over here. So that's the thing, right? So now it's working, and now if I want to use this in student, I can actually, I can actually come in student over here, and uh, 
in the student code. Um, instead of C this, I, can, I, I included utils.h, so now I can actually say uh, stno is set to u.getint. Uh, and I want the value to be, say, a five-digit number or a six-digit, five-digit number. So I'll go <clears throat> one, two, three, four, and I'm going to go over here, one, two, three, four, five. Five digits, I said? There you go. And in here, I'm going to say, student number. So it works the exact same way, but it's using that. Okay, it's more elegant. And your validations happen so comfortably and easily. Now, uh, if you want, you can actually add another optional thing over here for the error message of the invalid value. You can do that too, if you want to. Anyways, you can modify your code anywhere you want. But go crazy and start putting stuff that you reuse over and over in that utils. It helps your debugging. It makes sure that you're not going to make mistakes and uh, makes your code robust. Are we okay with this? Questions? Yes? How you can operate the, uh, the file when, when, I com when you commit the um, one more check and one is it linked to another? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's why I said create a Git repository, call it utils, and put it in there. And create that repository so your repository directory for utils is the place you're going to always copy. So as soon as you add something, you put it in your repository and you push. So anytime you want to pick it up, you pick it up from there. Therefore, you're going to have the la latest version all the time. Okay. Now, there is a way, but we're not going to go there. So. That's, it's not for this. Like usually when you're, my apologies, usually when you're doing real development, your utils is actually a library that you have somewhere that you include as a separate thing to your project because you don't usually give your source code to, to, to be evaluated that way, right? Um, but if, uh, so if that's the case, then you will have separate things and you're going to be using it here. Mm, yes. Your executable becomes bigger, okay. but when we come, later on, when we get to templates, you will teach the compiler to write the code for you when needed. So templates are essentially that. It's a future thing, people, not now. So in future, we tell to compiler how to write a function, and we ask the compiler, only call this function, only cr create the code of this function if the function was called. So you, no matter how big it is, you're not going to use it until you call it. And as soon as you call it, automatically the compiler would actually bring the code inside the thing. So it's a conditional include, I could call it. All right? Yes. It's always zero. Everything is zero. Different versions of zero. So for pointer is null pointer. For Integer is zero, for Boolean is false, for double is 0, 0.0. Essentially, now that we know default constructors, empty curly bracket calls the default constructor of the object, whatever it is. Okay? So if your default constructor for a student is setting the student number to 9999, then if you put a curly bra empty curly bracket in front of a student, then the student number becomes 9999, not zero. So what I'm saying is that if student of mine in here if I said over here something like one, two, three, four, five, six, something like that, then empty curly bracket means name is null and student number is that. Okay? Anyone else? Yes. So you mean to, to uh, which one you're talking about? Let me just bring it up and see what you're talking about. So we are talking about, like, uh, these error messages? 
Uh huh. Yes, you ha a fourth argument, you mean? Okay. Oh, so you have to make put no. You cannot. Sadly, you cannot. Um, that that can't be done now. Again, when the time comes, you're going to see there's. When we get to, you're asking futuristic questions. When in future, oh, in OOP 3, 4, 5, you're going to learn that. that um, let me pause this. Any other question? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I have the code. Um, and I have problem because uh, it's a value. Mm -hmm. So each time I just design that I'm calling. For loop with a, that, oh, yeah, I have to see. I have to see your code. I have to see your code. Definitely, I find a way, but I have to see your code. That's number one. Number two, something that I have to mention about workshops is that uh, um, every workshop is designed to teach you one aspect of what we are doing. So if you see in your workshop, it doesn't ask you to validate the input and output. It's not related to what you're saying because I'm seeing code right now as I'm marking workshops, I see people are doing validations for entry when, they, when they, we didn't ask. Don't waste your time. The, the, when the validation is the target of the workshop, we're going to give you vicious validations to do. For now, if we are asking you to get an integer and we are not asking you to check to see if it's good or not, just don't do it. Just get it, OK? Um, and dynamic memory allocation resizing, common. Microsoft Teams will go through it. I'll go through your code, and I'm going to give you feedback on it. Um, I will. Uh, I am. I have started uh, sending feedback to, uh, on workshops, and when you get feedbacks from me, this is what you are going to get. So you're going to get links to this page. So. You see, it says marking. So what you are going to get is something like, for example, this. So only this line, it's going to be in the email. And it's going to be a link. So you, if you click on it, it brings you over here and says signature and citation at the top of the thing missing or is not accurate. Because there are so many repetition of things, I put it like this. So I just send you the link. So for example, if I, uh, if I told you something like this, and I sent it to you. OK, I'm saying always pack repeated logic in class in your private function. I have problematic code. I'll show it to you something, and I'll show you how to, what the fix is. It doesn't mean that you wrote this, but your mistake is similar. So you look at this code and see how it's fixed. So as you see over here, it's deleting the same thing in five different places. And I'm saying instead of doing that, create a function called freemem and call the freemem over and over. So you see how it's fixed, and re re you reapply that thing to your code. So when I see something new, I literally get the code of the person, and I just fix that one, and I add it at the bottom of this. OK? Therefore, what I strongly suggest in your free time, if you want to know what is a good practice for coding, come in this page, marking, and start from the beginning. Just read the feedback at the top. If you know the thing, skip and go to next one, and then next one. And if you don't understand what it is, it means it's, you haven't been taught yet. If I say, friend helper functions, what the heck is that? It means forget it. Go to next one, OK? These, these are good practices of things working. So, so if you want to know how to write an efficient code and what is a good code to write, these are all there. Okay, and after I give you feedback on these, I accept, expect you not to make that mistake again. So you make the mistake once, you get a, if it's a, just a thing that you normally don't know, I'm not going to reduce any mark. But if I see you do make a big boo boo, like something that we mentioned several times, like don't repeat your logic, create a private function instead, private method instead, and I see you are using the same thing over and over six times. Then you lose a few marks, not too much. And if I, even a simple thing, and I tell you, and you do lose mark first, if you repeat it, then you're going to lose mark. 
usually the first time I don't produce any bugs. And I randomly pick you guys to defend your workshop. So you're going to get announcement for me to book an appointment with me. We're going to go through your workshop three, part two. So you're going to book an appointment. I'll bring it up and I'm going to ask you questions, right? Tell me what you have done over here, what this code does over here. If you cannot reply, the mark of that workshop is zero. OK? So careful. Um, you need to understand what you're doing. If you see a sample code somewhere and you're just copying it, you better know what it does. Just to, don't copy it. OK? And if you cite it, you're fine. If you don't cite it and you don't know what it does, then yes. Everything. Everything. Lab, DIY, project, everything. All the things. OK? You need to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, that's plagiarism to me. The code you provide and you have no idea what it does, that's plagiarism. Easy, straightforward, OK? If you know what you're doing, mission accomplished. Even if you copied from somewhere, I don't care. If you know what it does, it means <laughs> you learned it, right? OK. So uh, you got to get those messages from me, and then uh, we're going to book an appointment, and uh, we'll go through it over Teams. And I will record the sessions to know what, what's going on. If something goes wrong, then I have evidence for it. So those sessions, interviews are recorded and then deleted afterwards if nothing's wrong with it, if something's wrong with it. And then I'll keep it in case you told me, oh, you gave me that for no reason. Then I'll bring it up and I'll tell you that's why. Uh, so. Um, that's that. Uh, any questions? Um, I don't think I have anything else to cover today because we are pretty much, let me just go through. And I'm converting that thing. I, am, I've, I have started that, uh, what is that thing? Intro, intro to, to op.sdds.ca. Is that the one? Yeah, so I've started doing this. So the, don't think that it's there. So I am converting the, 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 the notes into this one. <laughs> the rest of them are not there. It's just the first one now. Okay. <laughs> so the first page is done, and I do it little by little to, to add it over here. So you're going to, um, so if you go over here, please, that's not the website. You still have to go the good old thingy that we had. Either if you cannot log into global thingy and it doesn't allow you, downloadable versions are over here. And if you have access, then, it's, then your uh, uh, links are going to uh, take you here. And here we have uh, uh, construction and destruction and current. Oh, 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 oh. I forgot something. So let me explain that. OK. Uh, how much time do we have? I'm going to let you go like 10, 15 minutes early, so that's going to be your break, okay? I'm not going to give you a break now. Give me 10, 15 minutes. And it's, it's a, this is a quick one. It's not that, that difficult. <clears throat> so back to student thingy. Now that we learned this utils thingy that we have over here, let's come to, to, to here. Um, take a look at, uh, for example, uh, this set that we have over here is setting actually a, a, a the, the student, yeah. Um, so what is the room number here? 3504. 3504, okay. So this is the lady's cell phone over here, right? So. If I ask the lady over here, where is your friend's cell phone? Is she going to say it is in room 3504, or she's going to say it's in this room? This room, right? Because we are all in this room. So when we are, when we are all inside something, we call it this, right? This room. So this laptop is in this room. This student's this room. This teacher is in this room, right? But I don't know. Cameron is uh, in the other room, or I don't know. Cornell is the, in the other room. So we, I, I, so uh, in room yada yada yada. I'm not going to mention this. Do we understand this? 
Are we okay with this? Yeah. We have that feature in C++ where you can find out what is the address of current object in memory. You can do that. You can actually see in C++ where am I in memory. And that is done with the keyword this. So this returns the address of the current memory, okay? Current object's memory. So if you have a student called S and you have a student called R, the function that is called from S will have the address of S. The function that is called from R will have the address of R. They have the address of the current object. Are we clear on this? Okay, so, and the question that I have from you uh, is this actually. So let me just put this one over here. I'm gonna say over here, uh, 06, <laughs> get int test.cpp. So the, ad the question that I have is a very simple pointer question from you guys. So if I have over here integer pointer p, and I have p having address, of, and I have an integer i, and p holding the address of i, okay? To get the reference of i through p, what do I write? Target of p, correct? So this is the same as reference. So if I actually write integer reference r is equal to i, target of p and r are both references of i. Do we all agree with this? And if we don't agree, that's a fact, know it now, <laughs> okay? So when you say reference, it's R, so ref, so actually, target of P, R, and I are all references of I. I itself is a reference of I. It's its name, right? So R is a new name for it, and target of P means I, which means it's a reference. Are we okay with this? Now take a look at this. Zero seven, how to get references of things. Now back in here. In this set thingy, let's say I'm coming in student here, and I'm gonna say, hey set, don't return void, okay? Don't return void, set, return, a reference of student, okay? Return a reference of my own type, my own owner's type. So set is returning the uh, student's reference, okay? And then in here, I'll do the same thing, student reference, and now I'm gonna say over here, return this. Target of me, address of me. So set now is returning a reference of a student that happens to be its owner. So set itself becomes a new name of its owner. Therefore, in main, in here, when I actually want to set a student, so I, can, I have something like this, I'm gonna say, uh, what am I going to say? I'm going to say student s uh, jack, just for the heck of it. I could have left it empty. Then s dot set to Homer and one two three four five, and I can immediately say dot display. Why? Because s.set is returning the reference of s. Therefore, the whole thing means reference of s. Therefore, display of s will be called. It creates a cascading effect. 
Got it? So now if I, and returning the reference of stuff is very normal. Um, for example, <clears throat> the display that we have written over here is awful. What if you want to show the student name and student number in a table? And it's the column halfway through the table. You are going to the end of line at the end of each line. It is impossible to print something after in the same line, correct? That's awful. I want to choose if I want to go to new line or not. So what do I do? I'm going to say display. What is the object? What is the class of C out? O stream, correct? So in here, I'm going to say return an O stream reference. OK, obviously, I'm going to come in here and do the same. So in here becomes O stream reference. O stream reference, but because I cannot, first of all, it's O stream, then I have to include, include IO stream. And because it is a header file, I cannot use using namespace STD. I can't do it. I'm in a header file. Therefore, I have to do it manually in here, say STD. O stream display. But anyways, I'll come back over here and in here at the end I'm going to say return C out. Cuz C out is the reference of O stream. So so the display will be the new name for C out. Therefore I remove all the end lines in here that I have. Okay? I'll remove all the end lines that I have. And now the display that I'm showing in here, if I actually, if I actually write over here something, see out, I'm going to say display uh, is has overwritten Jack. Okay, and I'll do like this. Therefore, now I can actually print something after it without going to new line. But what if I want to go to new line? Say I want to show the first one and go to new line. I'll go s.display and out. Why? Because the display is returning C out. Therefore, it's the new name for C out. And that becomes a new line for that. So I can choose to go to new line if I want to or not. My object is returning reference of another object. My function is returning reference of another object. This one is returning the reference of O stream. This one is returning a reference of itself. So my preference is that at any moment, if you have a method that is returning a void, that's a waste. Don't do that. Always return the reference of the current object. Why? Because it may come in use. It shortens your code. At any moment you see there is void, it doesn't hurt. You can simply, where is my uh, header file? So that's that one. So in, in, oh, and in here I have to put STD. Uh, yeah, it's that student. So in here, in this set thingy that I have, I'm going to make it student reference. And I'm not doing anything. At the end, I'm just going to say return this. That's all. It just gives me the possibility to write more stuff in one line. I don't have to write several lines. Everything can be done quickly. Are we okay with this? Also, set can be used at, to clear, can be used to clear conflict, which you should never have. But it's a very bad thing to do, but I will show you some bad programmers do this. You see the set over here that has a name and a student number, right? Imagine like some crazy person writes over here M underline student number. If that's the case, I have to say M student number, <laughs> which one is what? See, right now it's a conflict. Because I call this the same name as the classes method, but classes member variable, which I'm not supposed to, I don't know which one is what. 
Here, it's actually you're writing this to itself, so nothing is being set in a class. How can I make this thing to be the class's attribute if I have a conflict? You can always use this. You can always say this student number. Oh, not like that. This is a pointer, right? That removes a conflict. So you are saying this stu m student number, the argument will set m student number the attribute. Very, very, very bad thing to do. That's why I ask you to write m underline. So you don't have to awkwardly rename your, uh, your, uh, mem uh, your, uh, your arguments to not to have a conflict in name. M underline is a standard to say this is a member variable. So, but if some not case does something like this, that's the remedy for it, which is a very bad thing to do. Because you, if you do this, eventually one day you're going to make a mistake and forget to put that this thingy. It becomes a bug for heroes to find because it's very difficult. When they see this, they don't look at the argument. They think it's the member but you're actually dealing with the argument, and the bug is there, and nobody can find out. I don't know why it's not being said. So very bad thing to do. Very bad thing to do. Thing to do, always use a different name for arguments. And you have no problem doing that because we, the rule is that the member variables start with an M, OK? And that's the current object. That's the thing I, I missed. Questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right. OK. That's it. Uh, have a beautiful day. Let me just stop the.